Welcome to The Homeless Conservative, a show about principled politics for exhausted citizens. I'm Blake Fisher, and I'm a political junkie so that you don't necessarily have to be. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule to listen or watch. Today, I have a repeat guest, Amos Giora, who you may remember him from our conversation about how bystanders allow the continued abuse of children in schools. Well, he originally wrote about bystanders in his book, The Crime of Complicity, which was about the bystanders of the Holocaust. And both of Amos's parents were survivors of the Holocaust, and I wanted to talk to him about does he see any parallels or warning signs with today's rise in anti-Semitism, especially post-October 7th and the lead up to the Holocaust in World War II? Like, are there parallels? Are there things we should have learned from the bystanders of World War II to prevent the same kind of thing from happening today? Amos joined me from Israel, where he's currently working on a new book over the summer. And a quick note, I am currently dealing with a sinus infection and was operating on like four hours of sleep because I went to a concert the night before and had to drive back from Dallas before hopping on the interview with Amos. So I apologize for how tired and crazy I sound maybe, but uh, there's no filter apparently. I've looked online. There is no audio filter for make me sound awake. I haven't found that audio plug-in yet. So here's my conversation with Amos. <laughs> Well, cool. I just thought we'd talk about, you know, we talked briefly last time about about this and how, you know, the bystander thing. We were talking about it in the in the sexual predator stuff with kids, but you obviously wrote a whole book about this from the Holocaust point of view, right? And so I wanted to have you on and talk about this because it's seemed to have only risen since we last talked. So when I began this by now it has become a project, I think. Yeah. 10 years ago, or the initiative, as the law school is calling it, the Bystander Initiative. You're right. I began by examining the Holocaust through the lens of my parents, of whom I knew nothing when I began the book. Yeah. And I don't even, I don't think, if I think back 10 years ago or 11 years ago, I don't think I'd ever even heard the word bystander. I mean, I had no idea what, what this was all about. And I certainly didn't know what the word enabler was is which obviously has also become you know part of my my life in every which way when i examine this through the lens of the holocaust and i want to make it clear i'm no i am not a holocaust scholar in any way but when i started reading about the holocaust and trying to understand the holocaust through the lens of my uh, late parents it became clear to me that without the bystander and enabler the perpetrator, Hitler and friends, would not have been able to do what they did. And while the perpetrators, whether in the Holocaust or today, are of zero interest to me, I really, really have no interest in the perpetrator, what is clear to me is the bystanders slash and or enabler are the ones who, um, without whom the perpetrator could not succeed. Right. And whether through the lens of the Holocaust or today's sexual assaults or a new book project that I'm under, which I've just begun, about the Holocaust and Israel today, trying to combine the two. Again, it's full circle, back to the bystander and the enabler. Yeah, so a few interesting stats I found. So there was an Economist poll recently, I think it was actually in 2023, but said that one in five, so 20% of 18 to 29-year-olds don't think the Holocaust happened. And 30% of them aren't sure. So a full half of people that are 18 to 29 are not sure or are confident that the Holocaust didn't happen. And then we have like Trump dining with Nick Fuentes and we have ADL saying that in 2023, we had more anti-Semitic in incidents than any year prior that they've been tracking, which was like, I think wait, wait, 2023 and wait until this year. Yeah. And this year it'll be even crazier. Yeah. Cause this was obviously, we only had a few months post October 7th in that survey data. So, I mean, it had increased 140% over 2022, 2024, I assume we're going to be on the same kind of thing. And then obviously, it's not higher. and we've seen all this kind of campus stuff going on, which has an obvious, sometimes explicit anti-Semitic tone. What do you think, what do you think has gone wrong that we've like, this continues to escalate and doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be flat. It seems to be actually getting worse. And where are the elements where we go? Okay. That is, you know, there's ignorance. Then there's like actual bad stuff. And like, how do you determine what to go after as, as someone that could be a bystander, you know, us. I think one, your word, ignorance or lack of understanding, lack of education, I think is important. 
we can disagree on facts. I mean, you know, Newton and the apple really did fall from the tree. It really did fall from the tree. Those are facts. Yeah. The Holocaust really did happen. Yeah. Those are facts. We can disagree on, on interpretation. So, for instance, you know, the campus protests, some view it immediately as anti-Semitism. Others, like me, are, are very careful with it, tagging everything, anti-Semitism, 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 because I don't necessarily view it that way. I think there's legitimate criticism of Israel. Yeah. And I fully understand that. Uh, as someone who's openly critical of the current Israeli government, yeah. I think that's totally legitimate. I mean, I'm out there um, when I'm here in Israel demonstrating against the government. So I'm very careful to say, oh, that's anti-Semitic and that's anti-Semitic, because I think that that draws too too broad of a, of a stroke, if you will, you know, like this. Lack of education or ignorance plays a role, I think. I can, I've watched on YouTube uh, people who are demonstrating are, are being asked basic questions. The river to the sea, which river, which sea? For some people, they you know, wouldn't know which river and which sea. Um, some people are asked, where's where's Gaza, where's Rafiah, what's this, what's that? And you can see that they are out protesting, which is great. First Amendment, I'm for a huge supporter of that, but are not particularly knowledgeable about why they're out there. Yeah. That's a problem. Uh, X years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I was involved in an effort in Utah to have Holocaust education mandatory. There are some states that have mandatory Holocaust education, and we didn't succeed. I, I think that's important, by the way, in the same way that I'm sure that from the perspective of the Armenian community in the United States, the fact that I'm sure an overwhelming number of people have never heard about the Armenian Holocaust in 1915 and what the Turks did to them. I think they too, because they reached out to me and asked me if I'd be willing to be involved and help them in terms of making Armenian Holocaust education mandatory. Yeah. I think those kinds of things are, are really important. You know much better than I do because you're we're a different generation, a different generations. Social media is not helpful. No. Is because not at all. The, the, the amount of misinformation, disinformation, and what is it called? Clickbait that you, you know, you move from place to place. Yeah. But it goes deeper than that. I'll, I'll give you an example. I gave a talk, not important where, a number of months ago by Zoom about October 7th and the, and the unimaginable sexual violence done on Israeli women. Yeah. And I got an email from a lawyer. Um, by his name, I think he was Jewish. He writes to me, Amos, it's always good to hear you talk. And we all know the next word is but. But. <laughs> but every, this is a lawyer. Everything you said about October 7th is nothing more than hearsay. And, uh, you know, there are two or three responses. One, we, one is to delete. Two, you can well imagine what the response right, is. Right, yeah. And three, and three is in the same vein as the second. But you say to yourself, here's a lawyer who took the time to listen to me, you know, prattle on for an hour, an hour and a half. And that's the best he's got is that what happened on October 7th, the unimaginable sexual violence is nothing more than hearsay. Is that ignorance? Um, and I think by, again, I, I'm careful here, but I think by his name, he was, he was Jewish. Is he anti-Semitic? No. Is he ignorant? Yes. Is he anti-Israel? Probably. Is he going to say whatever Israel says is, is wrong? Probably. Um, we, have in, in, in Judaism or in American Jewishness, a phrase called self-hating Jew. Yeah. So I don't know if this, if this particular gentleman was, was using the word gentleman and loosely, right? Right. Was, right. He, <laughs> was that um, self-hating Jew, ignorance? I don't know, but I find, by the way, I find his, his, his response in many ways far more disconcerting than campus protests. Oh, me too. Because from him, yeah. from him, I would have expectations. Like, right. And, and what I can't figure out is like who's to blame for that because I think there's, first of all, the, like I've heard that too because I've had the same pushback for that kind of thing. Specifically that they're saying that that there's why did no I mean like I've literally seen people say then why aren't there people that came forward? I'm like because then they were murdered right after they were raped. Like this is not there's no witnesses because they were murdering the and also they were videoing this and and broadcasting yeah, so it. I'm told that an online, like, was it Facebook, uh, Twitter, or X, I know, yeah. Instagram, TikTok, blah, blah, blah. There's a significant amount of not only October 7th denial, but like Holocaust denial, yeah. but absolute denial of the sexual violence. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you had a chance to see the video released last Saturday, like 10 days ago, of the 
five women from the um, military unit that were largely murdered. Yeah. And five of them were captured. And you can, it's a three minute video. It's awful to watch. Yeah. I did read on Facebook, I think it was, that somebody wrote, um, I didn't see any violence. I'm wondering to myself, wait a minute, hang on. There are five women whose faces are bloodied, who are in, beyond fear, beyond fear that you and I cannot imagine. And the best this person can write is I didn't see any uh, violence. So he, I don't know what's being covered in the States. Here there's talk maybe, maybe, maybe of some kind of a hostage release. We'll see. One of the real concerns, which something we're going to have to deal with if there's a release of some of the women. It's assumed, based on intelligence sources and others, that X percentage of the Israeli women are pregnant. Right. Um, meaning they, they were imp imp impregnated by their rapists. If that's not violence, then you got me. What's violence? But don't you think that... So I, th I, 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 I will let ignorance play a role in some of it because I do think the media has been especially egregious post October, October 7th on the way they've covered it. They always believe Hamas's press releases. They, mm. they, they, mm. they then to treat the IDFs as skeptical. We're, oh, well, we're skeptical about what the IDF says, but we're going to believe anything Hamas puts out. We saw it with the hospital bombing that wasn't really a which bombing. Which was not thing. a bombing, right, which is a, a bomb gone wrong by Hamas, right. Right, we're seeing it now with the with what was no doubt a some sort of error of the fires that happened in the encampments, but it was like, you know, the for the headlines to say it was a strike on an on a civilian encampment is not what happened. They it sounds like they struck some Hamas leaders and there was a fire that started and we're going to figure out what's going on. But the point is the fog of war, instead of waiting to figure out what happened, they're immediately saying, Oh, it was a strike on civilians. And and you're going, well, hold on. Why do we always assume it? Like, it seems like the pendulum always assumes one direction on this with the media. So I, I forgive some people because everything they read, unfortunately is, I feel like a little slanted, but when I see something like denying that the sexual violence happened on, on October 7th, to me, that's such a sign that you've made up your mind about this sort of oppressor oppressed narrative and you and you filter everything through that, including if Hamas themselves videoed the atrocities, it they still can't they go, well, that that could be faked. I mean, it's, it's almost like the it's like arguing with a flat earther at this point on some of this stuff. It seems like their mind's already made up and they're only looking for the evidence that supports their side and, and ignoring even video evidence of anything happening that goes against their narrative. But I don't know how to prevent that from happening. It seems it's very like, interesting. Yeah. It's two, you have two really interesting examples. The, the failure to acknowledge or the unwillingness to acknowledge the sexual violence. I don't have any hair to scratch, so we'll call that a head scratcher. Yeah. To me, that's, Akin to Holocaust denial. Right. The the strike which led to um, the the deaths of, of innocent Gazans. There was an uh, there's an article in today's Haaretz, which is our version, which is our newspaper, which is a, our New York Times. Yeah. And which says that the IDF um, pretty much screwed that one up. Yeah, and I believe they, it. They had, didn't have sufficient intel. They, uh, if you want to kill these two guys, who I understand were two seriously bad dudes, you know that's fine, but these kinds of operations require the kind of sophisticated intel that when this war will be over, obviously the intelligence community here in Israel will be the emperor stands naked. I don't think there's an emperor has no clothes. That's obvious. Yeah, I mean, because I of October 7th happening in the first place, obviously. That's exactly that's... right. Good, that's exactly right. And this strike, again, from the article this morning, suggests that the intel was, was faulty and the, and the execution was worse. And the results are what the results are. You are right, there's, there's invariably, if not inevitably, a rush to judgment when, quote unquote, Israel is perceived at fault. Some people will tell you that's anti-Semitism. Some people will tell you that's anti-Israel. I will tell you that's also Israel historically, from my perspective, does a really poor job of what in Hebrew is called spoke speaking, to vote, which is speaking, I mean, explaining yeah Israel doesn't do well with that at all yeah and it's also hard and you know what's the expression in your business a, th a picture tells a thought was one picture a thousand words yeah, yeah. Uh, um you know kids who have been killed that's a devastating picture a because the event's devastating right no matter what and two no matter what that's exactly right but that in no way in no way justifies denial of october the 7th right and i think that's my 
problem is that what I see is that we obviously in war, war's bad. Like there's no there's no war where there's like not this kind of bad stuff that happens. There's not civilian casualties, there's not mistakes, there's not and I think the thing that bothers me about it is that so often, and I think this goes all the way up to even how Joe Biden is talking about it. Cause in my honest opinion, like at the State of the Union address, I timed it. He spent a, he spent less time talking about Hamas and how they could end this right now, you know, by just releasing the hostages and giving up, and spent more time sort of chastising Israel. And I'm not saying that you can't say this is a complicated situation or that Israel is not worth having you know, being, being critical of, but it, it was interesting to me that it was kind of like this precursor of like, Hey, just so we like lay, lay it all out on the table. Hamas get in this right now, but Israel has to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And I feel like we're not holding Hamas to the same levels of stuff. And it just seems like it would like, I don't understand how every day the president of the United States is not talking about how eight of these hostages are Americans. Like, it just seems like something that should be talked about more often and it's, it seems like we're trying to skirt the the inconvenient details to well you know he's trying to play to the very far left progressive his base which I, which i think politically is foolish because i don't think they're that big of a majority i don't really think that the democratic party is this like full of anti-semites i think there's some bad stuff on the far left i think there's bad stuff on the far right but i think most people are like yes we understand october 7th was terrible and i think most people do understand that it was israel being attacked and they should be able to go after them, obviously within the rules of law and or rules of you know war. But it just does seem like I understand where if I didn't have to dig further than I have to to find a different opinion on things, because sometimes you read something and you go, well, this doesn't seem like this could be totally right. And it just seems like if you just were a casual news consumer, maybe you don't ever see the thing that says that Israel didn't actually strike that hospital. You know, you just see the first headline and never the second one. So in some ways I understand how you would get a picture from seeing headlines over and over again, but I don't know how people can combat that when you, when you do call something out like that, like with the lawyer, I mean, so I was curious, which way did you go with it? Did you kindly respond? Or I, did I, you I deleted, delete it. Okay. Deleted. But I do but wonder I like, when do we push back on that? I, you know. I want to go back for a second for the State of the Union address. I think that President Biden was speaking to the Israeli public. Yeah. And what he was trying to do, I'm not sure successful, but I think I understand the effort was to say the following. Netanyahu, like Trump, has his base. Yeah. And that base is going to be Netanyahu's base, like Trump's base will be Trump's base regardless. Yeah. I think what he was doing was, was trying to reach out to the broader public and say, I ain't got no beef with you all. I have a beef with Netanyahu. And for Israel and America to have the kind of relations we all want, you all need a different prime minister. Right. I think, that, I think, I think that's what he was saying. And I think that he and Netanyahu have, uh, I don't think there's any doubt, they have a terrible relationship. Yeah. I don't think President Biden will ever forgive Netanyahu for what Netanyahu did to President Obama. I don't know what Biden's going to do with this, this, from my perspective, this terrible invitation to Netanyahu to come address the Congress. Um, I understand, I understand the, the Republican politics. I think as an, as, as an Israeli who believes, firmly believes that Netanyahu is, is the greatest disaster that has hit the state of Israel ever, 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 for the U.S. Congress to grant him legitimacy at this moment, um, I get I get Republican politics as an Israeli who believes that this government must end its days today. Um, we need to have elections immediately. We need to be have elections with Netanyahu gone from the scene electorally for the Congress to invite him to give him that 10 minutes of Andy Warhol or nine, whatever the hell it was, six minutes of fame, nine minutes of fame with yeah. Congress where the GOP will cheer, cheer, cheer. I assume there will be Democrats who will boycott uh, and buys Netanyahu legitimacy, which he no way uh, deserves. Uh, he is a unqualified and unmitigated disaster for Israel. I think that's what Biden was, President Biden was trying to um, drive a wedge, if you will, between Netanyahu and his base and the broader public. Yeah, and I think that I think he's also just trying to calculate on like trying to be everything to everyone. And I don't think it works very well in this specific so, situation. Listen, at, at, my, at my age, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. I leave American politics to others. Yeah. Um,
but I, 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 I viewed his speech, I view all of his, whenever, whenever he talks about Israel, I view it speaking to us here, um, us here in Israel rather than to um, the American public. But I'm sure, as, as you know, that's also part of the equation. Yeah. Do you, do you see parallels between what's happening now and what you've researched in kind of the researching bystanders during the Holocaust? Do you see, like you mentioned, some of it might just be ignorance. Some of it, like once you can educate someone, I saw the thing from the university of uh, the Berkeley professor that basically did a survey on the thing you mentioned earlier, where it was like, did a survey, you know, on the, from the river to the sea thing, but you're right. 40% of them couldn't name the river and the sea. And once they name a river, couldn't name a sea. And once they were explained what that really meant and like, here's the river, here's the sea. And that means this can't exist. Most of them changed their mind. There's like 80 something percent of those people went like, Oh, okay. I no longer agree with the phrase. And so obviously sometimes it's worth pushing back and educating people. Sometimes it's not like there's probably, you're right. Calling everything anti-Semitism on the college protest would be silly because honestly, it's kind of a bunch of rich elite kids cosplaying it's, as it's activists. A lot, it's, just, I, right. it's a non-starter. I, I, again, I think, so you catch me literally, what is it here? It's Monday afternoon. I just had a four hour meeting uh, with some Israelis as I begin this new book project, uh, which seeks to, we'll see if I succeed. Um, tie the enabler in the Holocaust and post-Holocaust through the lens of my mother in Hungary to the situation here in Israel. The book um, for now is, I think the title is Enablers Through the Ages, because I, I think to be able to really understand what led up to October 7th and post-October 7th with, I mean, we can talk about Netanyahu until forever, Yeah. but the more complicated issue, which I think is more deserving of attention is the ecosystem that enables him in the same way that there was an ecosystem 80 years ago. I know without comparing what's happening today to the Holocaust, I get criticism for that. Trust me. I, I well, right. Well but I mean, we should be able to look at history and, and see how it's repeating itself or rhymes or whatever the saying is, you know, but you can like, learn from it. Gotta learn That's from right. it. I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, here in Israel, there are, from my perspective, there are X numbers of X numbers of members of the government, who two of them who I know because I worked with them, who I'm convinced know that, that Netanyahu is an unmitigated disaster, but for their own reasons, are willing to support him, albeit I'm convinced that they know that this is not in the national interest. Maybe it's in a self-perceived self-interest, or maybe they see themselves as nest. It's important that they be there uh, to prevent the the absolute crazies, because we have absolute crazies here, from having a seat at the table. But you know as well as I do that you can convince yourself of anything. Yeah. Do Do you think there's a reasonable difference between the common thing I see is like someone will say, like for example, some of the college protest stuff was like explicitly pro Hamas or like globalized the intifada, these sort of things that were very, like global intifada. Yeah, these kind of things are like, okay, that's pretty like on the nose anti-Semitic, but then you get a pushback. Sometimes it's like, no, I'm anti-Zionist versus anti-Semitic. Like, where do you draw that line between those two things? And, and how do you think that, because I think sometimes people are using it as a sort of get out of jail free card that I can say I'm anti the state of Israel or anti the way things are doing, but it doesn't seem like it's always criticism of the way they're executing things. Like, you know, we, we had letters from these college like groups on October 8th that were praising what happened. You know, it's, it wasn't based on the reaction yeah, and, from, and from professor, hang on. And from professors also, right. That anybody, I, I mean, I've seen, uh, um, not word for word, but paraphrasing, what happened on October 7th was, was I heard, what I heard was the, the chains being cut off or some phrases like that. It, it, uh, I mean, you want me to be polite with you? It, to say it left me speechless would be the, the polite version. Is that anti-Semitic? I, I don't know how anybody in their right mind can justify the murder of 1,500 innocent people and the murder, the rape murder of, of babies, the burning of babies, and the rape murder of women. Right. If you can justify that to yourself, then you and I don't exist on the same planet. I mean, I mean that's just, that is to me, 
beyond horrific. You and I can be critical of, of Israeli policy. We can say that this policy and that policy, and, the, and the, you know, we haven't moved forward in the Palestinians say we could, those are legitimate points of discussion, 100%. Totally agree. And Lord knows, Lord knows I've written on it, I've demonstrated it. Uh, but anybody who writes that, in essence, legitimizes the burning of a Jewish baby is so uh, horrific. Is I mean, I, I don't think there is even a word in the English dictionary that defines that. Yeah. Is that anti-Semitic? It's anti-human. Oh yeah, I mean yeah. it absolutely is. But it does seem like the it does seem like the Jews as a population have Could been be. on the end of I, that somebody, kind of dehumanization right, over I, and over throughout I'm history. I'm obviously I'm not the first who who said this that it's you know it been eighty years since Jewish babies were burned alive. Yeah, it's been eighty years since Jews were decapitated, um, and to call that legitimate resistance. Um, what I heard with the chains of, of occupation relief cut or whatever the hell those expressions were, that's unhinged. Some people corrected themselves, but I think it's always the first impression that is the first response that matters. Because maybe to your point, first of all, read the facts before you weigh in on something you don't know anything about. The criticism of Israel is not not inherently anti-Semitic. I agree with that. It yeah. Can be, Totally legitimate. I think hailing H A I hailing right the the burning of Jewish babies, that's of Israeli babies, Jewish babies. That's that's unhinged anti-Semitism. Yeah. You want to protest against the Israeli West Bank um, policy? You know, hell, um, go ahead. Well, they want to protest against Gaza, against you know whatever. Totally. We would but guess not, that all the people that were at the concert that they murdered and raped were probably the people that would be at a protest against those things. You know what I mean? If someone's in an all night rave, the music thing, it's probably, they're probably lean. They're probably not in the hardcore Netanyahu fan club. Like you spoke not. about earlier, I think right? that's one of the reasons. Let's see if I can find this for you. You know, and that, and that bothers me a lot because it's like, okay, that is where we're taking this down to a level of 100% it's because here, of they're in picture. Israel. Um, there is a picture that will tell you everything you need to know. This is, we have on our cars, we have all kinds of stickers. So my car has been vandalized. I don't know how many times. This is not my car. This is somebody else's car. Can you see the yellow sticker? Oh, hold on one second. Let me switch to your different, different camera. Hold on. Uh, well, yeah, pull, pull it up a little higher. I can't see. And I'll have you send this to me too, because I'm happy to. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so bring them home now. Which okay, you're talking about hostages, says, right? Bring them home now. Yeah. And it, it was it was ripped off the car. Right, and then and this has here been a Israel, thing. Yeah. That we have here in Israel people who view the hostage release as 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 capitulating to Hamas, giving in to President Biden, and therefore they are very much opposed to the um hostage release. Well, and like I said, you're going to have here people, in Israel. that's, you know, but we had the same thing going on here. People were tearing down the posters of the, of the hostages sure. and stuff. And, but it, here in Israel, yeah. here in Israel, Israelis tearing off cars, stickers calling for the release of hostages. Yeah. Wait, hang on. Hang on. Is that anti-Semitic? No. Is that anti-Israeli? No. Uh, what is that? So I hang on. It's hard on. to know. I tell my American Jewish friends, when they tell me anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, when I point out that we have here um, a term that makes people like you uncomfortable, I get it. We have two members of the Israeli government, um, our Minister of National Security, I think it's called, and our Finance Minister, who are referred to many as, as Judo-Nazis. Yeah. I know it's a phrase that makes you, makes you uncomfortable. No, but I mean, I've heard, um, yeah. The, the, it's, yeah what's uh, what's ben, his name in the West Bank? Yeah. Who grew up down the street from us. Um, and Smutwich, the, the finance minister, they're unhinged, from my perspective, uh, vile racist. Ben Gvir has more indictments against him and has been convicted, I don't know how many times, uh, yet he's, a, he's, he is in the government and he, he is essential to Netanyahu. He's the one who keeps threatening to break the, the coalition apart if Netanyahu gives it on the hostage deal. And this guy has been convicted of racism 
incitement and violence. Yeah. Hang on. So when he goes on and on about the Arabs, when he goes on and on about Biden, when he goes on and on about any hostage deal, is he an anti-Semite? No. Is he anti-Israeli? No. Is he a unhinged, racist, perhaps fascist? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that's where I don't see enough calling out of that kind of behavior if it's on your quote unquote side. So that's probably, it's obviously anti Arab racism in his case, right? Uh, Itamar Ben Gvir is happy to have, is he, he asked the, the police, he asked the, the, our FBI, the Israeli security agency, to monitor who's going to protests. Yeah. That's a police, that's a police state. Yeah. And the head of the eyes, the head of the ICA, the Israel security agency, Ronen Bar last week said, absolutely not. We are not a police state, but you have a police, the minister of police asking the, 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 our FBI to monitor who goes to protest. That's, that's how police states works. Right. And I think that the problem is that, or at least what I see from the America side of things and not obviously being Israel is that what people tend to do is they find the worst actor on a side of an issue mm. And then they paint broadly with, well, that's the whole country. Even though there's people inside your country that are protesting against that guy politically. Sure, look at me. Just Absolutely. like here. It, and it, it'd be the same thing here in America. It's like, obviously, we've had really close elections. It would be like saying, well, you know, take the worst political actor and then try to paint the whole country. Would Like, would you excuse that kind of violence in any other country just because they have whatever, some bad actors or some bad government policies or whatever the situation is. And and I feel like we do it on both sides. I feel like we're, we're seeing it with the sort of defense of Hamas as like le legitimizing their, the terrorist attack of October 7th as legitimate sort of, oh, well, they're the oppressed so they can do whatever they want. And, and to me, the we're colonized, just, the colonized, yeah. I'm willing to make you a bet. Never bet your last dollar. Cause you know, you got to feed your kids or in right. my case, also my grandchildren, right? If you were to ask the typical guy out there, go Hamas, go, if he has he or she has a clue what the Hamas charter says, I think the answer is going to be no. If you ask people who call for, what is it now, the expression, global intifada, is that right. the right? Is that the I right think that's now? what they're calling it, yeah. They, is that what it is? They would know the intifada, I mean, the history of the And I speak as someone, I don't know if you know this about me. When I served as, the, as a military prosecutor in the West Bank Military Court in 1987, I um, prosecuted the first uh case in the intifada so i i mean i i've been around the block you've been right? you know in, a thing or two yeah i do i actually do um that's what you want you want a global intifada i mean but see and i think to your point earlier again you know way more than i do the role of social media in terms of of legitimizing the kinds of phraseology if that's a word that for me is untethered and unhinged again with the understanding i get free speech i get criticism of israel you can read what i write but you cannot from for me celebrate the burning of a baby right and i think that's where there's such a clear line but there's also you're right social media makes it much much worse because we've seen how TikTok is what very i mean i think clearly congress saw enough information about i think post october 7th to see that TikTok specifically was pushing the anti-Israel trend mm. more than they were the other one. And they they could see how China was putting their thumb on the scale of the way a, a large majority of young people in America are getting their news. They're saying that is their primary news source is TikTok. And then they're seeing, and, and I would say, no matter what your side you're on, you're probably not really getting a nuanced version of anything on TikTok, whether it's pro-Israel or anti-Israel or pro-pick any issue. Honestly, it doesn't. Oh, really... You know, I, I so I was just on vacation in Copenhagen, which, by the way, is I go back today. I mean, not tomorrow. Oh, well, next week because there's basketball games here in Israel. I'm going to, but you see young Danes with Palestinian flags. And, okay, yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. I was tempted, of course I didn't, because I'm a visitor in their country, to ask them like basic questions to understand if they, or just to under, just to engage with them. Yeah. I didn't, of course. If you understand what, not what the Palestinian cause is, I get it. I, I think, you know, I spent 15 years of my life negotiating with Palestinians for the, for, to resolve this damn issue. But if they understand what Hamas is, there's, there's a difference between 
the desire for a Palestinian state, which I'm all in favor of totally, and Hamas. Yeah. And I also remind, I also remind that in 2006, seven, when uh, Hamas replaced the Palestinian Authority, yes, in elections, but before the elections, they, uh, they knocked, they killed them. They yeah. brutalized them. Um, and I think that's, that's important. And I, and I have no doubt that is for at least at the moment lost to the, the um, dustbin of history, unfortunately. Right. And I also, it, there's this all other tricky situation where I obviously have lots of sympathy for Palestinian civilians too, especially because they, you know, canceled all the elections after they got Hamas in there and Hamas murders all the opposition. But, Hamas and all won that a stuff. Democ- but I want to emphasize yeah. Hamas won a democratic election. Yeah. No, no, they absolutely did. And so, you know, in some way it's like, yes, well, they voted for this. I know that they then suspended elections afterwards, but at some point, when do Palestinians need to take like I, what I don't like is that I feel like we, in all of the rhetoric and all, in most of the media, it feels like Israel's constantly expected to, not even just, but I mean, because you read some of like, especially like military experts on urban warfare, and they're going like, look, the civilian casualty rate is actually quite remarkably low compared to every other thing, and it's clear that Israel attempts to, yeah, the urban warfare, yeah, uh, there, there, there will be. We'll have nine thousand commissions of inquiry here. Yeah. One of them will clearly be, and I would think other militaries will be interested to learn from the IDF, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of urban warfare in a place like Gaza Strip, which is about the size of the room you're sitting in. Yeah. Um, and I and I think that that has proved to be beyond challenging is an understatement. Oh. I think that here you'll all, here you'll also here in Israel. You'll see criticism that the the IDF was prepared to fight Iran and wasn't prepared at all for Hamas. And, and here we are, eight months later, and Hamas is uh, b- battered, clearly, yep. beaten. Nope, 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 nope. Well, and I think that that's a good point of like that's something that it, within Israel they've got to figure out as far as you know. There was obviously security failures of October seventh. Maybe obviously, I am a totally different ball. Yeah, and and that's all stuff that. Absolutely, I would never criticize as being anti-Semitic or even anti-Israel or anything like that. That's just like stating the facts of like the Israeli Absolutely. citizens were failed by their government in the sense that they couldn't protect. And, you know, Russia is going to have to deal with, I think, I mean, if Russia was a normal country, would deal with the same thing with their terrorist attack. It's like, well, it seems like you're putting all your effort into across our border and then you let ISIS you know, blow up a building here. You know, there's there's some of these things or they came in and I guess shot it up. And then, yeah, yeah, no, but I don't, yeah. I don't think, I don't remember if Pravda, wink, wink covered that the following morning right i don't think so and so what i think what my problem like what i guess what i'm trying to say is that it seems like there's no palestinian people don't ever have to have any responsibility for the fact that they elected hamas and the fact that they i mean first of all hamas is using them as in in as really, human shield as left human right shields. And it's it is, gross it, there had been discussion here I think around January, February, but by now all these months have melded into each other. That would Gazans rise up against Hamas. Right. And there had been noises, there had been isolated incidents. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know enough to, to suggest one way or the other, but if there had been hopes, I'm not sure that they have been realized, and I don't know if they're realizable. The other two questions which we haven't even addressed is the West Bank to where, and then the, the other issue here in Israel is Lebanon to where, or the Israeli-Lebanon uh-huh. conflict. There are 100,000, 120,000 Israelis who live on the, on, on the northern border who are, home, in essence, homeless. Yeah. Because, right, and the government has abandoned them 100%. It's here, the, it's, what is the 3rd of June? School starts in two or three months. And there are, I mean, hundreds, I think hundreds of thousand Israelis and who, don't, who live in northern Israel who don't live in, in their homes. No idea what will happen with their kids, where they'll go to school. And the government uh, has abandoned them. The Israeli government has 100% abandoned its own citizens. Now, when I say that, does that make me anti-Semitic? No. no. Does that make me anti-Israeli? No. It makes me outraged with this with this horrific government. Right. And meanwhile, over here, I feel like we don't even hear about the North Front. I feel like it's just not something that gets it's, talked about. It's very ever. interesting you say that. It's very interesting you say that. Um, 
I could do a, if I walk up in the, my street here where we live outside Jerusalem and ask my neighbors up the street, what do you think about what's happening in the north? And they would say they know very little because it's not, again, not sufficiently covered by the Israeli media, which is a whole different topic. So, I mean, it's interesting that that, that entire conflict and really, you know, there's just obviously Iran's funding all of this stuff. I mean, that's the really frustrating thing is that it's all these proxies of theirs, you know, that I feel like we continue so to the, give them the, a pass. The night that, that Iran attacked Israel with the, with the unmanned, right? Yeah. The IDF, particularly the Israeli Air Force, was was brilliant. A textbook in, 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 in knocking down the drones that were fired t- towards Israel. Textbook, brilliant. Brilliant imp- strategy, brilliant planning, brilliant execution. A plus, A plus, A plus. All armies of the world will can learn from that, 100%. On the other hand, we, we can't knock out Hamas. On the other hand, Hezbollah, today's Monday, right? On Saturday, it's a, um, I'm not religious, I won't use the word miracle, whatever word you want. Um, rockets fired by Hezbollah uh, hit a military base in northern Israel, caused significant structural damage. How no soldiers were killed, I don't know. I don't know. You know, whoever you think, you think. And Hezbollah, yes, is, 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 is a, seems to be a significant force, which is why I told you we can talk about Gaza for hours. We also have the West Bank. There we have a real problem with Jewish settlers who are absolutely taking advantage of the situation in Gaza and taking advantage of the fact that the government protects them. And we have the Northern Front. And in the middle of all this, in the middle of all this, we also have, I think, the word would be the increasing shunning or ostracization of, of, of Israelis and of Israeli institutions in Europe. I'm not sure what will happen in America. I don't know what, it, what uh, if American universities will follow European universities. But I think that's an issue that also uh, needs to be addressed. Is that anti-Semitic when the, the, the not the air show, but the, the well, I'll call it the air show in Paris where all of, all um, the military complex, the military industrial complex comes to Paris to, to show their wares. The 74 Israeli companies that go to these things will, are banned as of last week. That is a huge financial hit. I mean, enormous right. financial hit. Is that anti-Semitic? I don't know. Is it, is it anti-Israel? don't know. Is it a message to Netanyahu? Probably. Is it in line with the ICC and the ICJ? Could be. Um, but the economic impact is, is is going to be very significant for the Israeli uh, military industrial complex. I think the reason I lean towards calling that anti-Semitic is because you're singling out a group of people based on their race or identity by where they live, not based on their political opinions or based on their, because like I said, they, we, we saw the same thing with some of the college protests, you know, one of the, at Columbia, apparently not, wait, not one in Columbia, it was Northwestern. One of the demands was that they didn't want the, the Sabra hummus in the, um, in the cafeteria anymore because it's a, you know, it's a Israeli owned company. And you're like, Sure. But you, to me, it is racist to assume that just because someone's right. Jewish, they are anti-Arab. Right. So Does that I, make sense? I saw there's a there's a professor, I'm, one of America's elite institutions, who does not want Israeli professors, teaching instructors, because quoting, uh, they're known to be hostile to Palestinian students. So those are the kinds of really, really dangerous statements because those things, you know, turn on a dime and can just are combustible. And that's what I worry about is that it seems like it's really easy to go, well, that's not, you know, that's on the margins and that, and I feel like, but it's like a drip, drip, drip that gets, you know, it's or a snowball going down a hill kind of thing. It, It eventually turns into we're excusing worse and worse behavior. So, to me, boycotting all companies that are in Israel would be mm. akin to boycotting every company in Mexico because the cartel did something bad. I don't know. There, it's it's a weird thing to try to go to the extreme that like, well, if you paint an entire country's people, because you're talking about businesses, it's one thing to say, right, I mean, to Netanyahu, or I don't like the way the government did this, or picking specific yeah. issues. But it's quite a bit different when we say we're going to take on an entire group of people and boycott everything they do to me that is where there's a line of like you might not think you're anti-semitic but i feel like you're across that line if you're if the judgment on what you're going to boycott or what you're what you're standing against has really nothing to do 
with anything other than their country of origin or or racial or religious identity because and to tie and to tie it all back to the enabler if i can pull this off in this book right yes this is one of the costs of netanyahu's enablers is this that by propping him up or keeping him around when he, while his trial is ongoing and while he's responsible more than anybody else for where we are, the cost, for instance, to the Israeli economy is staggering. Yes. Um, I don't know the numbers, how many are still called up to reserve duty, but those are, those are real costs. Yeah. Or the fact that on Saturday, um, one of the Belgian academic institutions announced that they will no longer engage with Israeli academic institutions. That's that is, in terms of a cost, that is significant. Um, don't ask me which country because I don't remember. Because somebody just texted me, some country announced yesterday that Israelis are no longer welcomed. Um, that that's problematic. Yeah, you can you want to have the ICC issue an arrest warrant against Netanyahu? That's a different discussion. But to say no Israeli can come to our country. Right. Um, it's an interesting question, by the way. I haven't even thought about it until now. If it, that ban applies to Jews or if it applies to 15 percent of our population who are Israeli Arabs. Right. I haven't even thought about that. Until and, now. And, and I think that's the other interesting thing to me is like, OK, I don't hear as much. I don't hear the protesters. I don't see a lot of articles that are like specifying this is just because we think Netanyahu has to go. It doesn't seem like it would be like, mm. you know what I mean? I think if Netanyahu was gone you need, tomorrow. You need, you need, what are you doing next Saturday night? You need to come here. You come, need to come to our protest. I'm going to be I'm gonna be in Indiana, uh, Indiana, America, visiting my wife's family next Saturday night. But That uh, wins out. Um, <laughs> a little different. You need to come here to see the protests. But yeah, I think that's where I'm wondering is like, it doesn't seem like if they, let's say they got their way and even we got, their dream version of a ceasefire or Netanyahu's gone or whatever. I don't see that this is going back in the bottle of like, we're not going to see these anti-Israel protests. We're not going to see, like I said, cause I think that they've that moved is over. A really. That, so what, what is called the day after. So you ask a really interesting question. First of all, Netanyahu has no interest in that day after because he doesn't want to go to jail. Right, and he's trying to hold on to, you know, this is his way to stay, stick around 100%. as long as this is going on. And that, totally. that, that makes sense. 100%. 100%. You ask a very interesting question. Let's say let's say tomorrow there are elections, and let's say that the, there's a new prime minister, not Netanyahu. Will the sanctions and, and the anti-ness whether it's anti-Semitic or anti-Israel, will it dissipate the next day? That's a, that is a really, really interesting question. I think the answer would probably be that the protesters or those who are driving the protesters would put on um, a wait and see cap, you know, cap like a hat, yeah. um, to see whether or not a new government would engage with the Palestinians, would withdraw the IDF from Gaza, would begin, I don't know with whom to rebuild Gaza. I don't know what's going to be the role of the Egyptians, the Qataris, the Saudis in all this. Um, you, you ask a really interesting question. And, I, and obviously none of us know the answer to it, but the only reason I hedge on saying I don't think it would change the dialogue a lot or the, or the weight of it is because I think so much of what it's turned into, at least from what I read and stuff, and I think even people like Barry Weiss at the Free Press, who kind of calls out the DEI stuff as being inherently anti-Semitic in the sense that they, it doesn't follow along the lines of, oh, well, if you were ever an oppressed minority, you you know, there's sort of this mentality with the whole DEI stuff and the equity that says, well, once you're an oppressor or, or an oppressed, like that's it, oppressed. that's the line and you can't ever come out of that. And the Jewish people over and over again in Israel even has overcome the adversity of being, you know, the one right, Jewish but place no, in the region. I, I think I'm no expert on the, on the protest. I told you, yeah. I, I know what I know and I know what I defer to others. The, the labeling and I, I, you know, give credit where credit is due. The successful labeling of, of Israel as a colonizer yes. has clearly had, from the perspective of the framer 
as a positive impact in terms of the protests because you're able to lump Israel into get lump Israel into the category of oppressor of oppressor colonizer. Right. And and I and I think that clearly has been effective, at least short term. But you ask a very interesting question. You know what? Now you're giving me homework assignment, aren't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I didn't mean, I didn't mean to give you homework as a professor yourself. You're on summer break. You didn't want homework, but no, I'm actually not. I, okay, I, you're I'm not. On okay. Summer break, but I'm writing this book. Okay. Um, you ask a very interesting question: whether these con- the the consequences will be impacted if there's a change. I mean, not consequences here. Here, obviously, it'll be impacted. There'd be yeah. But worldwide, I just wonder if, like, once you've already labeled someone as the oppressor, it doesn't seem like that side, like, so the left left side of the anti-Semitism, because I think the right and the left side, even though they kind of meet back in the middle where they're, like, maybe both anti-Semitic on the fringes, they're different kinds. Like, the right is much more explicit, and they're not trying to cover it up by doing this oppressor oppressed thing. I mean, even though there's the conspiracy theory nonsense on the right about Jews controlling the world and space lasers and whatnot. I give credit where, where I give credit where credit is due. In in the book, I will give a shout out to you because you ask an excellent question in terms of the the, the, the long term impact. Not here, I mean here being is, but where you sit, whether you're in Texas or in Indiana, um, whether this is retrievable, yeah, undoable, and, and that's what worries me is that it seems uh, like. Part of the problem is that I think part of the problem with the Holocaust, and this is not to in any way victim blame, but you talked about how your parents never talked about it, right? They never talked to you about it as their son even. And I think that a lot of Holocaust survivors were like that. I think that a lot of people... It's a 50 It's a very interesting. There are all kinds of studies on this. It's a, I, the people who I met with today, that's at her home. She's a little bit older than me. At her home, that's all they talked about. I have other friends like her. I have other friends like me. It's literally a 50-50 split with Holocaust survivors. And it's interesting because I can see why if you if you don't have someone around you that's talking about that and in education systems they stop talking about it, I can see why 50% of young people think it might not have happened because they've probably never, again, they've not been, I don't want to say forced to, but I think this is like... No, no, I, no. I, I, so especially... so. One of the real concerns, so I'm, well, I am what is called second generation. My children are third generation here, obviously, and so are my grandchildren. One of the real concerns in the broader American, I think, American Jewish community is not second generation my age, but third generation and fourth generation Jewish, um, particularly perhaps with the rate of, of intermarriage, what will... Uh, people know about the Holocaust? Will people, third generation, you're somewhere I assume in your 30s, will people of your age go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington? Right. Is that something that, that schools will, you know, nudge Johnny and Janie to go to Washington to go there or to other Holocaust museums? That is, I mean, that's, that's how we began this conversation. That's a real question. It's a sort of, it is for many, I don't, I don't know numbers, obviously. But a source of real concern, or will the Holocaust, you know, dissipate into history? Because to me, if you look at post Holocaust, post World War II, whether they were the people that didn't talk about it or did, you know, large percentages, higher percentages of Jewish populations excelled at the things they did and sort of came out of that terrible, terrible event. I'm not saying everyone, but I'm saying, you know, they, they do get to the point where they're winning like more Nobel. I mean, statistically, they win more, more Nobel Peace Prizes, more Nobel Science Prizes, things like that, where they're out, they're outperforming other races, other religions, other things like that. And I think what happens is that it's not so much that we just don't teach about it, but it's not, it's not that we want to teach about it so that there's a permanent victimhood. I don't think... I don't think that's good across the board. I don't think it's good to tell an Not entire group of people that they're victims for forever because a bad thing happened to them. And I would I would say arguably nothing worse has happened to any group of people worse than the Holocaust in World War II. I just like I don't you know, I'm not slavery was terrible. There's all sorts of absolutely terrible things. We don't need to try to compare them and have like a a, a race of who's the most oppressed. 
I think the important thing is to go like, what happened to lead to the oppression and how do we prevent it from happening again? And that's what concerns me is that all the alarm bells that you've written about, about how people became bystanders during the Holocaust, I see some parallels of that happening now. And, and so it's not so much that I want to be like, oh, Jews get to forever be the victims because of the Holocaust. It's more like we need to see what happens so that we see the warning signs of something like that happening again. And of course, it's happening right now in China with the Uyghurs or like pick any one of the other genocides that are actually mm. going on right now. And I feel like we're just not interested in sometimes that thing because once again, it becomes whose side is who's on. So I feel like the China stuff doesn't get brought up because unfortunately there's a lot of people that don't want to, you know, it's like they're trying to in the government, they're trying to negotiate things like trade stuff with China. If you're a business, you're trying to sell stuff in China and so, I mean, that's where I see the most obvious parallel to something like what happened in World War II. I leave, to Jews. I, I tell you what, we'll make a deal. I leave the Chinese and the Uyghurs to you. That's fine. I leave American politics to you. I'm happy to, I'm not happy. Yeah. I, the, the, the two, the three, uh, there are three things I know something about. Four. You know what the four are? Yeah. I do know a little bit about the Holocaust. I know a fair amount about here. I know a ton about Michigan football. Yep. And I know a lot about the basketball team here in Jerusalem that we support. Yeah. Those are the four things I know. Uh, that's good. Uh, you know, I do appreciate going like, I don't know the answer. That's fine. I mean, I like that people stay in their lane sometimes. I feel, but I just, I worry about what happens when we don't talk about history, when we don't talk about the warning signs of you. like trying to say, like, here's, here's real bad anti Semitism. I, here's the stuff that's on the margins, just students being idiots, you know, and, and I don't know if you have a good way to, is there a good litmus test for how to determine what's the stuff we should like be vocal about being like, what's the stuff pushing back? If that lawyer had said something like, what's the line where he says something where you go, I have to push back on this because it's so listen, I get So obviously I get hate mail, obviously. Right. Yeah. Um, I get death threats also, obviously. Um, it's very unfortunate. Like, Cause I don't feel like anyone. Should I've made, for their I, listen, I, maybe you can find fault with me. I I've made the decision when I get, so I wrote a column this a couple of months ago and about the conflict here. And I got a lot lovely responses. The best one which I think probably tells you everything you need to know. You blank Jew. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. It's a shame your parents weren't burnt in the Holocaust. Yeah, and you're just what like why? Like, but hang on. Somebody actually sat at a keyboard and did tuck, tuck, actually took the time to find my email address. Right. And took the time to, like, actually, I assume he or she thought before they did tuck, tuck, tuck. There were, I mean, it was grammatically correct. There were no mistakes. It, 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 there was a beginning, a middle, and end. And you say to yourself, like, whoa. And then it's just but trying to figure you, out. I can assure you, I can assure you. Uh, if the intended effect, if the intended purpose was to have me, you know, stop writing and, and then of course not, not going to happen. Um, no, cause I, you know why with this, I finish, young man, cause yeah. I won't be an enabler or a bystander. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the right attitude to have. And I think that we've got to, we've got to figure out how to, I think you're going back to your thing about being a bystander and, and saying you won't do that. And I think that your social media thing's a perfect example of like, would that person say it in person? I don't know. Like they, like there's a lot of people that'll say stuff behind a keyboard. I tell you a story. Wait, hang on. Yeah. I, there is a, there is a, uh, there's a blogger, I think it's called who, who for a number of, for a while had been all over me. And, um, I gave a talk not important where, and there was, when I finished my talk, there were questions and this, the, there was a question asked from the audience. And I said to the audience, audience, I don't mean to be disrespectful to any of you here, but the person who just asked me the question, I have to ask you, are you the blogger who's been like all over me? And this person turned 97, you have red color books behind you, turned <laughs> 97 shades of red. And I said again to the audience, huge audience, hundreds of people there. I said, I don't mean to waste anybody's time. I turned to the person. I said, you and I can have a discourse, but dude, like you're unhinged. I mean, all you're doing is tracking me 
and Giora said this, and Giora spoke here, and Giora said this, and Giora, Giora, I said, listen, it can't be, it can't be that you are so invested in, you know, bashing and bashing and bashing. And then you come to my talk, and I, and during his, as he was asking the question, I said, that's him, right? I love and, that you connected the dots with just the way he was talking and your previous correspondence. <laughs> Oh, correspondence is one way. Yeah, right? I guess one um, way. But again, people like that, if they're intended, I can only testify as to myself. If the intended purpose is to um, silence me, even when I got, I mean, I got really ugly death threats. Um, and I, I actually wrote an op-ed about what it's like to get death threats. And then you're a fork in the road. Do you stop? I, I mean, I have friends who have stopped when you get death threats. Listen, people have families, people have kids, right? Right. It's, it's serious. And I have a friend who stopped because his wife asked him to because, you know, they had at the time they had, they, have a, they had a teenage child or whatever, and she was concerned for the kid. I get that. Totally yep. get that. Um, I, when I got the death threats, I remember I, I thought to myself, because my late mother, I'll, you know what? I'll leave you with this story that you will appreciate this. My late mother, uh, do you know what Google alerts are? Yeah. So my late mother had Google alerts on me. Oh, boy. <laughs> that can and, be dangerous. And, and the question was, when the death threats came, would she get the, would she see them? And we were really, really concerned with how, because a lot of it was all about the Holocaust and Holocaust denial. And fortunately, I didn't know this, Google alerts are, the logarithm blocks death threats. Oh, that's good to know. No, no, it's actually really good to know. And so mom didn't see them, but I told her. Because I figured better she hear it from me than to, you know, get your, you know, go right. My late mother, whose Holocaust story is awful, could not, underline, could not, could not, could not wrap her mind around Holocaust denial. Understandably. It, she lived through and it. it. And my mother, who um, you always knew exactly where you stood with my mother, she was blunt with her language. Uh, was, could not in any way ra rational, rationalize. And that, I think, if I think back, I mean, it's ugly to get those death threats. And I just said, you know, the hell with it, and I'll keep on writing. And then, hang on. And then when the book Crime of Complicity, which is how we began this, came out, there was pretty significant criticism of me in the American Jewish community. Um, oh, make that face again. Why? Because the criticism was that I'm using the Holocaust, using my mother's story, using the Holocaust, to tell a contemporary story about the bystander in contemporary society. And I went to Mom Giora and I said, good Lord, if you are offended by my telling your story in order to explain the bystander in society today, I will stop immediately. And Mom Giora said to me, um, you tell them to mm, off. Yeah, it's the way my mom talked. <laughs> and 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 if my story, not mine, my mother's, if my story can be used to protect someone today in a way that I, not me, her, was not protected eighty years ago, well, keep on telling you my story and tell them to mm, off. There you go, Mom. You are the best. I think that's a great place to leave it. Amos, thanks so much for coming on and talking about this. Really appreciate it coming You're on the again. Best. Thank you for having me. All right, we'll talk to you again. Thanks again to Amos for coming on the show again. I appreciate his expertise, and I appreciate you joining me for the conversation. If you found value in it, I'd love if you rated it wherever you're listening, and please share it with someone. That also helps me a lot. You can follow me on Instagram and YouTube at The Homeless Conservative. You can feel free to reach out with any questions, topic suggestions, or disagreements you might have. You can also email me at blake at the homeless That's it for me. I'll catch you next time. <laughs> <laughs>